what is the biggest story you're a part of? And where is it going? That'll be the point of this video. We're starting a new series, Eschatology 101. I know that's a strange word. It's fun to say, so to help you remember it, I have added a cat. Meow. Yes, when I was a young youth minister, I said eschatology, and that's just simply not the right word. So I, I, I wanted to help you out to remember what the word is by adding a cat. Meow. Eschatology. Eschatology, let's get into it. Eschatology is just a fancy word for the end of the story. So we are going to take an extended look at the end, the shape of the end of the story. But we must think about the very story that we're telling before we get to the end. Hopefully as we think about the end of the story, the rest of it will grow clear. And when we think about the rest of the story, the end will grow clear. Does that make sense? Every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And for the sake of this discussion, let's talk about it this way. It has a start, it has a conflict, a problem, it has a hope, a solution, and an ending where things are headed. That being said, I'm going to rephrase that a little bit just for the sake of this because we're talking about a meta-narrative, which I'll come back to. But let's go with the origin of the story, the beginning, the frustration right which would be the problem that we're trying to solve and then the redemption which is our hope and it ultimately points to the ending of the story the eschaton now so let's start let's go backwards right let's start from the end and go backwards since we're calling it eschatology 101 let's start at the, at the end and work our way backwards all right, so eschaton now. it is the final event of the divine plan the end of the world as we know it the end of the world as we know it. The redemption is kind of the rising action if we were gonna plot map your plan. It's what gives us hope that solves the problem. This is the solution. What is the frustration? Well, this is the problem. Every story, every big picture story, every small picture story has a problem in it. The frustration is the word I'm using here to describe the problem. Obviously the origin, right? Where does the story start? Because believe it or not, that's a big deal. Where this starting point of your story is helps you understand where you're going. So, are you ready to dive into it? Whether or not you've thought much about it, you are in a story. Now, a meta narrative, fun word to say if you want to say it with me, meta narrative. It's the it's the biggest story that you're a part of, right? Cuz we're all part of little stories, you know, the story of me getting off the couch and getting a sandwich because the problem was hunger and I resolved it uh, with the sandwich and the story ends with me rubbing my belly. Right? That's a small story, but we're also part of a bigger story. It could be the story of your life, of your family, of your family history, of, of a particular nation, region, of a particular people group. Uh, what is of a particular species? What is the biggest story you're a part of? That's a meta narrative. I'm going to give you a meta narrative that you've heard of before. Now, I am going to parody the plot map of the Big Bang. Before I dive into this, I do want to say I have no hostility between faith and science. I, I feel like that disclaimer is warranted. When I was your age, I wrestled with that a lot, and nobody I knew seemed to think that they were compatible in any form or fashion. It was you either believe one completely or the other completely, and they're incompatible, and I just don't see it that way. So disclaimer. Origin point of the Big Bang, right? There was a big explosion and right? Everything came from a big explosion. For those of you who are tracking this, who are uh, who love science, um, it actually started as what was known as the creation point theory from a Vatican astronomer, right? A Catholic priest thought that what he was seeing in the Big Bang was confirming what was in the Bible, that there was a starting point of the universe. Story, what is the problem of the Big Bang? Well, it's a hostile world. So if we're, if we're telling the meta-narrative lens from the perspective of biology, it is a hostile world that is hard to live in. There are so many things. It's a dangerous place. Everything's still blowing up. Now, the redemption right now, if we're telling this from a biocentric perspective, the redemptive moment, the solution, the hope we have in the Big Bang, if it was the biggest story we're a part of, is life itself, right? And guys, this weird looking bag-like creature is our oldest known ancestor according to the meta-narrative of the Big Bang. In other words, this thing that pooped and ate out of the same hole is the Big Bang's version of the Bible's Eve. Okay, and where's this thing headed? Well, nobody knows. 
Maybe it could be the big freeze where everything slowly out of entropy loses heat and everything freezes to death. It could be the big rip where the universe is continuously ripping apart. And it could be the big crunch where everything comes back together and push. So that is the eschaton of the Big Bang. A meta narrative is something that answers, it's the biggest story of your part of. So if the, if the biggest part of reality is summarized in the Big Bang, that's what we're exploring. We're not necessarily uh, uh, saying that none of these components have any dialogue with anything that we read in scripture. That's not what we're saying. Why would I explore the meta narrative of the Big Bang? Well, I want to say that that the story that you're inhabiting bears on who you are, what you think about yourself, where you're going, what defines what is good behavior, bad behavior, what defines uh, good views of yourself and other people versus bad views of yourself and other people. And what I want to point out is that the meta narrative of the Big Bang alone, if that's as big as the story gets for you and there's nothing else involved, there's nothing divine, that story doesn't give you a lot of answers about who you are or what you should do with your life. In fact, your eschatological perspective might be something like YOLO. Meow. In other words, do what you want, be as self-centered as you want because none of it really matters anyway. If that's as big as the meta narrative gets, we're gonna be scratching for something a little more meaningful, don't you think? The Big Bang is something the genre of the Bible does not wrestle with. This happened outside of the scope of the parallel of, of their the ancient Near Eastern worldview in which the, the biblical stories arose. So it would be more fair perhaps to compare the Bible story to another story available at the same time. Are you ready for the meta narrative of Babylonian myth? We're gonna start with the Enuma Elish. So let's plot map this thing. In the origin, there were these two gods, salt water and fresh water, represented by these deities. The salt water one was named as Tiamat. She was the ocean goddess of chaos. And somehow through their mixing and exchanging, there became a pantheon of other gods that were basically their children. At some point, one of those gods got frustrated. His name was Marduk. And uh, rather than letting chaos reign, he decided to split open the body of Tiamat and carve open what he called land. So out of the slain goddess, the oceans were divided. If there's any hope for humanity, guys, it's in the fact that when uh, Marduk had slain this god, he killed another god named Kingo, the consort of Tiamat. And out of his blood clots, he fashioned humanity in order to be enslaved to the gods and serve them in perpetuity. So our eschaton, our highest point of fulfillment within Babylonian myth is serving the gods as enslaved blood clots. The Enuma Elish admittedly doesn't really address an eschatological perspective, which is a commentary on itself. It's more of an origin myth. Let's dive into a Babylonian myth that does address the end point of humanity, the Epic of Gilgamesh. This hero, semi-divine, wrestles with mortality. Gilgamesh, wherefore do you wonder the eternal life you are seeking? You shall not find. When the gods created humankind, they established death for mankind and withheld eternal life for themselves. And my friend Amy Gallagher, who is an Old Testament scholar, said, he is without hope of exceeding limit his limitations. The record confirms that ancient Near Eastern literature taught man was merely to make the most of his time, knowing that death was inescapable. So guys, we better just get excited about serving the gods as enslaved blood clots, because that is our end game. Is anybody else a little annoyed at this meta narrative? Not very satisfying. You know, where is the Big Bang if that's as big as it gets, as, if that's as the, the summation, the biggest story we're a part of, doesn't leave us with answers that we're happy with or that we have to determine our own meaning and ultimately we can't confirm whether or not it matters. Uh, and there's no guiding principles for our behavior, right? Likewise, the Enuma Elish just talks about the futility of human life and that we're enslaved blood clots. If you were to put humanity in the meta narrative of these two stories for the Big Bang, if that's as big as the story gets, the humans are simply an accident that doesn't matter. And if you're to believe the Enuma Elish and you place humanity with the meta narrative of the Enuma Elish, you are an enslaved blood clot. Is anybody a little frustrated with these answers? Maybe these meta narratives aren't the biggest story we're a part of. Maybe there's a bigger story even beyond and even better than those two options. These two meta narratives are different, aren't they? Uh, one of them from something we're more familiar with, one of them from something that the audience of the Bible would have been familiar with, and neither of them leave us thinking, huh, I'm really hopeful about my life. Is there a narrative that we can be found in that 
gives us hope, that gives us direction, that gives shape to our lives and our meaning. I believe there is. You guys know where I'm going with this. Let's head to the Bible. It's the best meta narrative there is. All right. Let's plot map this thing. You guys know the Bible, right? The origin point. God created a good earth and he made a good garden and he placed a good humanity in it. Made in his image and likeness. Terms that mean that we were kin with God, family of his. A term that means that we are kingship, that we're representing God as his ambassadors. And a term that means that we're made in his image as in a cult image, a representative statue. We're living statues mediating the presence of God and we're to fill and to multiply and to increase his dominion. Now, you guys know where the problem was, right? We call it the fall oftentimes. It is the place where humanity chose for itself to define good and evil, a situation we might call moral autonomy. And apparently we're really bad at it. Adam and Eve thought themselves were bad. They hid from God thinking God is bad and then they threw each other under the bus. And then their children, as we see born into this broken status, well, the first two siblings, one of them kills the other one. Humanity doesn't seem to be very good at representing the goodness of God. So what is this gap? This is the problem. This is the problem in the biblical narrative. It's the problem of sin. Now, we see God not responding to that sin by wiping humanity off the face of the earth. Rather, he enters into the narrative of humanity with a family directly from Adam and Eve, from Abraham, from Israel, from David and ultimately to Jesus. Guys, this is the part of the biblical narrative we spend a lot of time discussing. Anything from Genesis 3 forward is part of the redemptive narrative of the Bible. You guys know it caps off with the figure of Christ, Jesus Christ, a man who is the image of God, fulfilling human identity and destiny and offering us a way into restoration. Now we find ourselves between this redemption of the cross and the eschaton of the future. So we live in this eschatological tension where some of the parts of this hope that we have at the end of the Bible are taking shape in the here and now. And what is that hope? That we would be completely with God again, restored as his images face to face together. All relationships restored. The relationship between God and man, the relationship between man and man, and man itself, and man and creation, all restored by the good and amazing expanding love of God. Now guys, that's a good story, don't you think? That story gives shape and weight. It gives ballast to the human experience. It explains why we are the way we are, is divided and, and unsure about what is good and evil at times. It explains why in Christ we find this hope that unfolds and gives us perspective, but we're not there yet. We're not at the end. We're not at the eschaton. And so, guys, if I were to wrap up and, and say, it, let's just look at human identity in the meta narratives, right? We can look at so many different aspects of relationship, of, of, of theological thinking, of finding meaning within the texture of your meta narrative. But what if we just pause and look at the meaning of humanity? What are you? Well, the Big Bang would say you're an accident that's meaningless and is destined for entropy. Babylonian myths would say that you're an enslaved blood clot, destined for eternal death. But the Bible, the Bible has a better meta narrative. It says you're made in the image of God. It says that you can be restored into that image of God and that ultimately you will be with the God in whose image you bear. The biblical meta narrative is a narrative of hope giving shape to the present, giving shape to the past, giving shape to the future. And as we think more thoroughly about the future in this Eschatology 101 class, as that takes shape in our hearts and minds, we'll be talking about the whole thrust of the story. Because when we know our origin, we can see our future better. When we know the problem, we can see the redemption better. So guys, join me in taking a look at your meta narrative. As we tarry over the meta narrative of the Bible together, I hope things start to take shape. To explore the, the end of the story of the Bible, the eschatology, the eschaton, the end, the final destiny, we are going to go through the biblical narrative over the next couple of weeks through certain themes. The Bible is so big, it's so full of so many rich themes that it's hard to understand the narrative arc as a whole all at once. So we're gonna take one theme next week, the story of dwelling and we're gonna trace the 
origin all the way to the eschaton of God's dwelling with his people. I can't wait. I hope this has been helpful. What is your meta narrative? What is the biggest story you're a part of? Ask yourself that question this week and join me next time as we think more thoroughly about what the meta narrative of scripture really means for where we're going. Guys, it's been such a crazy season that all of us have needed to think about the future in order to have hope. And sometimes when we think about the future, we get hopeless, we get anxious, we get worried. Sometimes we get overconfident and prideful. Neither of those things are quite true from the perspective of biblical eschatology, the view of the end aspired to, aimed at, pointed to by the biblical story. So guys, I hope you derive from the end point of scripture, the end point of the biblical narrative, a deep and profound hope that presses and reshapes everything about you in the here and now. How you think, act, talk, relate to people, relate to the environment. I believe we, my brothers and sisters, are invited into a incredible, incredible and beautiful story that will give you hope, an enduring hope, no matter where you are on the plot right now. All right, hope this has been helpful. Talk to you soon. Godspeed.